Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome back once again to Hot Technologies 2013. My name is Eric Cavanaugh. I will be your moderator for today's discussion, which will revolve around trying to define this really interesting discipline in our field called data discovery. And of course, we'll focus, as you can tell from the slide there, on high quality discovery. What do you need to have if you have good discovery? So this is an interesting format. This is a little bit different than the briefing room that some of you have checked out. So here's a slide about yours truly and enough about me. So of course the year is hot, there's a lot of stuff happening out there. And the reason I love data discovery is because you could really look at it as either the beginning and or the end. In other words, the first mile or the last mile of this whole analytical process. And I say that because a lot of times you have to do all this work up front, preparatory work, finding your data sets, identifying them, nurturing them, cleansing them, loading them into this system or that system, getting access to them various ways. There's a lot of grunt work that goes on, as many of you know, to get to a place where you can start doing some quality analysis. But the analytical process can also begin with data discovery. And really, there are a lot of different ways you can do that. You could argue that data profiling is part of data discovery. But really, what we'll talk about today is how to achieve data discovery through either data visualization or through, quite frankly, just mixing and matching a whole range of data sets and trying to get those acute angles so you can see into what's happening in your organization. And it's not a very easy thing to do, and I would argue that's partially because the, the tools for this part of the equation are just not really quite um, where at least I would want them to be. But I can tell you that we're getting there fairly quickly. We're starting to see a lot more activity around data visualization. We're starting to see a lot more activity around other kinds of discovery. So you can, of course, just look at an Excel spreadsheet, spend some time wandering around in there, and you could call that data discovery. It's probably not the, the best test case that we're talking about here today. So there are other ways you can do this. And obviously, usually you use some kind of visualization tool. You try to, to manipulate the data and look at it from different angles, and you wait for those different patterns to kind of pop out. It takes a lot of time and effort to do that typically, but what we're starting to see, which I think is very encouraging, is there are much more dynamic and interactive environments where you can work to play around with your data. So obviously we talk a lot about data visualization, but one of the, the difficulties with data visualization is that, A, it's kind of hard to mix and match the right data sets sometimes. A lot of times they don't really fit together. They're not really like puzzle pieces. It's kind of like taking apples and oranges and pears and telephones and throwing them into a box and try to make sense of it, or at least that's how it can feel sometimes depending upon what you've done and what kind of tools you're using and how it is that you're getting your, your job done. So here in the hot technologies format, what we do is we actually get two analysts and we ask each of them to give their own take on what constitutes a particular type of technology. So we're going to hear from two wonderful analysts today. You can see Jamie Fitzgerald right at the top there, founder and president of Fitzgerald Analytics, calling in from New York. We'll hear from our very own Dr. Robin Bloor, chief analyst here at the Bloor Group, calling in from North Austin. And John Woodward, CEO of Neutrino BI of the UK, calling in from Chicago, my old stomping ground. So he's going to give his perspective as well. So with that, introducing Jamie Fitzgerald, I'm going to hand the keys over to you, Jamie, and tell us what do you think constitutes high-quality discovery. Thank you, Eric. Really appreciate it. And uh, I believe I have indeed taken over the slides if I am, yes, if I'm able to do that. So um, I'm going to be uh, brief and hopefully helpful here for maybe five, seven minutes and, uh, and then hand off to uh, Robin. Really looking forward to hearing uh, from John and also uh, the interaction at the end with the Q&A and the roundtable. So just really briefly, I'll introduce myself. And uh, fortunately, I can do so relatively simply. I, I have this one obsession, uh, I guess uh, I call it a focus on this slide here, which is I just believe that we as a society in general are just not getting as much benefit from uh, data as we ultimately can, will, and really need to. And so my focus is on trying to make it easier to uh, to find opportunities and then unlock those opportunities from data. Um, my kind of attempt to do this and be part of this so far has led to my creation of 
the what I call the data to dollars value chain framework, which is a way to visualize it, and also an associated methodology, uh, which is now becoming a book coming out next year from Morgan Kaufman. So jumping in, I was thinking about today and also thinking about uh, this question of discovering what matters in data. And um, I decided to use this quote not because I am sick of this quote, but <laughs> I think that if we actually think about it more carefully, maybe there's something we can learn from it. So uh, I think it's been sort of an overused uh, quote that data is the new oil. Overused in the sense that I think it's just you know used as a trite phrase. But if we really think about it, data is, especially big data in fact, extremely high potential, and yet it has some other features of oil too. It's uh, pretty useless when it comes out of the ground all grimy and gross, slimy. Uh, you really need to refine this stuff to make it useful. Uh, you're never going to just sort of pull up to a uh, oil refinery or an oil uh, uh, um, an oil uh, extraction uh, location, you wouldn't pull up to the uh, the tar sands in Alberta and say, ah, just put some of that in my, my car. So you have to refine data, and that, I think, makes the metaphor rather, rather apt um, and means that, in fact, what we need to do in a data-centric world, especially in the area of big data, is we really need to become much better at churning data into a form that is useful to us in our lives, useful to us in our businesses, in our organizations, in our governments. We need to get much better at turning raw data into dollars. And uh, since it's useless in its raw form, uh, but priceless when used well, really the whole question is how do we engineer that transformation? Uh, now, I put a picture on the slide here of uh, Nassim Taleb, the genius author of various best sellers, and also the well-known big data skeptic. Um, and I, I guess I'm going to actually try to make Nassim Taleb into a little bit of a straw man here just uh, for a moment, uh, with all due respect and uh, great admiration for him. But uh, I saw Nassim speak at a conference I attended last month uh, at, that was convened by the State Department. The event was about big data in foreign policy and uh, predicting various terrible outcomes using big data, you know, pretty important stuff. Uh, making the world a better place, and uh, we had a you know we had lots of very uh, speakers who were very positive about big data, um, and then uh, Nassim Taleb was the uh, was the afternoon keynote intended to provoke and, uh, and 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 being the contrarian that he is, he was there to tell us that big data had really no potential and we could stick with small data or even if big data did have potential, nobody really knew how to use it anyways. That was, you know, your, your Asim Taleb uh, message. And I'm sitting there and thinking, this is a genius. He's so brilliant. He's a data-driven guy himself. And he's very logical. I mean, he must not really mean what he's saying. Um, uh, by the way, there's a question in the chat window asking um, Nassim who, I'm referring to Nassim N. Uh, Taleb, who is the author of uh, several well-known books, including uh, Fooled by Randomness, uh, as well as The Black Swan, and his most recent book, uh, which sounds fascinating, is called uh, Anti-Fragile. I uh, hope that, that helps answer the, uh, the question in the chat window. So anyways, briefly, to make sure I don't go over time, uh, after the speech, I buttonholed uh, Nassim, and I just wanted a moment to say, well, I mean, let's be clear, what are you saying about big data being bullshit. And uh, he said, well, all I really mean is that the more data you have, the more you need to filter out to get what's really useful. And I think that, we have to say, is a really good point. So he may be skeptical, but he's, he actually was, I think, really on point. The more data you have, the more you have to become effective at finding what actually matters in that data. And uh, that certainly is true here. And if we go to the next slide, this has been the framework that I've used to visualize that whole process, that refinement process, that journey from raw data to results. So I call it the data to dollars value chain. There certainly are other ways to visualize the process of turning data into results. Uh, I find this a useful one, useful way, however, and uh, also a very practical one, however, because it forces you to think about this process as, well, I guess, 
a process. Many people think about analytics as something, but analytics really is a sequence of steps using a variety of methods and, and tools and uh, various people involved, but it, it's a process. And it's a highly iterative process, but it is a process. And so if we visualize it as a value chain, which is a, a, a relatively common process framework, we can think about, okay, how do we actually get from here to there? How do we get to the results on the right-hand side? And uh, it's also helpful, I think, in putting various steps in the process into the larger perspective so that you can answer that question, why am I uh, doing what I'm doing? So uh, to zero in now on the on what we're talking about today, I really loved what you said earlier, Eric, about uh, data discovery, which we're also going to have to debate and refine our definition of as being something that is both at the uh, first mile, the very beginning of that journey from data to results, but also the last mile. And I couldn't agree more because you're going to use data discovery, and I think traditionally a lot of data discovery and what people have talked about as data discovery has occurred in this left column of the value chain that I'm showing here. So it's been used for things like uh, acquiring new data and then profiling it. If we take a look at that uh, that section here, uh, it's uh, been used to discover things that are in there and say, hmm, okay, this may be interesting, but it has to somehow be routed to, to some domain experts. Uh, profiling data quality, et cetera. Um, and yet, if we actually think about it, you can discover things about data at any stage in its refinement. And so I would argue that data discovery is hugely important even in analysis, because analysis consists of some analysis where you know exactly what your question is, but much analysis where you have either a loosely defined question or possibly even are not sure what your question is, although you do not know what your goals are, I hope. And so if you can design analysis to discover things related to what matters in your business, related to your goals, you can really make great use of a discovery tool that makes it easier in the analysis layer. And then, of course, on the results layer here, which I define as the place where you, you are making decisions or changing actions, unlocking financial impact, and also learning new things, kind of the delivery layer, let's call that the last mile. Um, data discovery, if it actually can discover and also deliver, is going to be more powerful. So to your point earlier, Eric, I think it's up to each professional to decide what they mean by data discovery, and, and we could perhaps use other terms like insight discovery. Uh, but at the end of the day, this process of discovering things faster that are more valuable is one of the most essential cross-cutting uh, capabilities in the journey from data to dollars here. Um, now, I just wanted to highlight one more thing before I uh, move quickly and hand off. Um, the value chain picture here looks linear, but the way you use it is definitely not. Uh, the navigation tips for this on the right here are definitely to avoid linearity, loop back often anytime it would be useful. Um, and data discovery is going to actually help with that. Uh, stay agile, that's kind of along the same line of sight, uh, along the same theme. The only other thing I would say is on the third point here, keep oriented. No matter where you are, it's important to know why you're doing what you're doing and what you're trying to get out of it, which basically means begin with the end in mind, understand what the key drivers of your results are, and that will allow you to maintain line of sight from wherever you are and whatever you are doing. Uh, so quickly moving to the next slide, um, salient trends in data discovery um, are three are listed here, although there certainly are more. But one is the increase in focus on agile analytics as opposed to a uh, more traditional waterfowl st style uh, approach to analytics where you take a long time to set up uh, requirements and figure out exactly what you believe you need to do, then you do it. Uh, now the, the cycle times are, are much less, and thank God, because frankly speaking, BI and decision analytics systems are not uh, very amenable to traditional uh, solution development life cycle methodologies uh, from the prior generation. Big data, obviously, has made it more important, and data visualization, as Eric mentioned earlier, has become a something people ask for, and yet it has certain limitations that we need to figure out how to integrate. Um, so the key success factors um, that I wanted to make sure I just put on the table, and, and then we can talk about these more later, are uh, to begin with the end in mind, really make sure it's still goal-centric, but, but with, th with that as your anchor, be as agile and fast as you can. Um, take advantage of both known unknowns, which 
by the way, that basically means questions you know you have that you want the answer to, and unknown unknowns, which basically would be, to put it simply, questions that you should have asked, but you didn't know to ask them until you saw something that might have been an answer to your question, and you kind of iterate around that. Uh, and for, obviously, the if you look back at the slide uh, on, uh, on the data to dollars value chain, one thing we notice is just how many different functional domains this process of using data well must flow through, and those domains have a variety of different levels of expertise, areas of specialty, subject matter knowledge, et cetera. Um, I better give it to you, uh, Mr. Bloor, otherwise uh, you'll probably never have me on again. No, no worries. Let me give the keys to uh, to Robin. But I love several of those comments, Jamie. I love it, <laughs> especially you asking him, why do you think big data is bullshit? <laughs> <laughs> Robin. That was fun. <laughs> that was good, Robin. The floor is yours. Okay, thanks for that. Thanks for that. Yeah, I think it's a good question. Why is it all bullshit? Yeah, good. <laughs> um, okay, in in the spirit of wanting to give a completely different kind of cut um, on this topic to what James talked about. Um, Although I kind of have to support the idea that this is an iterative thing, you know, and I think actually a number of people forget that that that, that you don't discovery isn't something, you know, you don't get a you don't get a heap of data and mine it clean of everything that contains. Actually, the heap of data gradually changes, new things emerge out of it. So discovery, uh, discovery is an ongoing process. If you know, if discovery is what you're actually after, as this initial slide indicates, there's a lot of things, you know, dashboards. OLAP drill down, visualization reports, and so on, and actually what data you can get at. The thing that I wanted to just kind of focus in on is the expertise of the BI user, because I think it's a kind of good question. I think that, you know, for a, a long period of time, you know, if we take the question, you know, is data the new oil, um, that's fine as, as an idea, and if we think of oil as turning into gasoline and you drive a car, then everybody has to learn to drive a car in order to use the gasoline. And I think that everybody also has to learn to drive data to a certain extent. It's not you just give access to data to anyone and they understand exactly what's going on. So, you know, there's a question mark over the expertise of the BI user, and there's also a question mark over the skills. Um, so I would maintain the next generation of BI, um, if we look at the last generation as just being the reporting and OLAP kind of generation with, you know, dashboards fed on a daily basis. Next generation of BI, in my opinion, is, is going to be based on end-to-end -end, um, uh, access to data. So you go from data access straight through to usage. In other words, the user has um, uh, a capability there. Performance to be much better than it was. In other words, you're actually looking at smaller timelines, really. Um, and then self-service to the extent that it makes sense. And the reason that I say to the extent that it makes sense, there's no, pe there's no, you know, there's no sense in giving people tools that are too powerful for them to use. In term, in terms of um, the self-service issues, there are a number of things. Uh, I, I say governance and approval, but it isn't just the data that needs governing; it's the people that need governing. It's not really that. It's not really that um, simple an environment. You know, it's okay giving BI capabilities to people, but the question is what they're going to do with it. I'll put, come across that in the news uh, uh, on the next slide. The, there's data self-service, which involves people actually knowing what the data is out there and being able to recognize what's in the various data heaps. There are the skills themselves. Um, it, it's like, you know, knowing when you discover something in data, knowing what it actually means isn't actually a trivial thing. There's a, you know, there is a whole, you know, there are whole PhD level things that one can know about that or not know about that. So there's there's a there's a range of skills involved here, and the the average uh, user within an organisation maybe doesn't have too much of those skills. And there's actual efficiency if the if the time the timing is off in terms of the, um, uh, the availability of knowledge that's fed through to you, then it actually doesn't affect you particularly because you can't use it. You actually have to have um, stuff delivered in a timely manner. Then there's this um, the issue of self-service and productivity, which is kind of an interesting issue. If you look at individual productivity, I'm kind of 
um, the diagram here. Uh, individuals you do various tasks, and nowadays mostly they're doing tasks with software. And then there's a productivity involved in any individual task. And then there's a productivity of the individual as they go from task to task. Um, and the point is at the level of self-service, once you give people self-service and they can go at data at one point in time, maybe they're, I don't know, maybe they're sitting on the end of the telephone and ans answering people's queries about things, you know. Uh, and maybe at a certain point in time they figure that they need to go and get information, <coughs> highly contextual. <coughs> and the level of service and its useful is not a simple thing. Because even if they have really great capability, if they haven't structured their job in order to be actually be able to use the data, or if actually the data isn't arriving fast enough, then it actually doesn't it, it doesn't improve the productivity that they have particularly. Um, may even make it worse. You know, they may spend loads of time diving into data because they find it fascinating, but it isn't actually improving their ability to fulfil their role. <coughs> And even in the best of circumstances, the user probably can't really self-design the way the whole uh, job works. But ease of use within software and flexibility really count, you know, because that gives them at least the ability to kind of self-design their own, uh, presuming they're not in a prescriptive environment. But if you talk about discovery and that kind of behavior, that's not a prescriptive kind of behavior pattern. So what I thought I'd do for the final slide is just put together what I think all of the issues are in summary. You know, there's data flow integration and automation that has to happen for this kind of thing to work. There's performance that actually has to work and it has to be timely. There's data coverage in terms of the data sources that you can get at. There's also the structured and unstructured data thing. There's data cleansing because not all data is clean, of course. There's data access skills. That is knowing what data you can put together and what it actually means. Then there's the visualization, the shareability, and the actionability of the whole thing. And then there's a kind of complementariness. I mean, people don't get given BI capability without there being already some that already exists. So, you know, <coughs> with any new product that people are thinking of, or even with any environment that people are thinking of, of boosting, then you actually have to shoehorn in the new stuff with the old stuff. That, anyway, is everything that I have to say. Um, so now I think we can invite Neutrino BI onto the stage. Yes. yes. Oops, yes indeed. Let me go ahead and hand the keys over to John. Okay. So John, I'm handing you the keys to the car <laughs> right now. Just click mm -hmm. anywhere on that slide and use the down arrow to go forward, but uh, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, first off, welcome, and, and apologies if you can hear planes in the background. Um, my name is John Woodward, CEO of Neutrino BI, and interestingly for a UK-based company, um, and as mentioned, I'm talking to you from Chicago near the airport today, so hopefully you don't, we don't hear too many planes. Um, as a company, we're doing a fair bit of travel at the moment as our unique approach drives worldwide, worldwide interest. Um, so thanks for all joining me online. Now, as we all know, discovery is a very hot topic, um, with many analysts referring to 2012 and 2013 as the year of data discovery, um, as data discovery tools you know, become the fastest growth area in the BI industry. And, and that's you know, backed up by you know, multiple research in, in, you know, from, from many analysts. Um, but from my point of view, whilst these tools have given us more agility, as was mentioned before, um, by unifying multiple data sources, faster implementation, more flexibility with data visualization and sharing, in my view, they still fall short of being, and I'll use the word, um, smart. Now, you know, Jamie mentioned the oil analogy um, to refine and filter, and this is never more true than today. And I'll try and explain why. Um, with a new approach that we're taking, um, a new concept that moves away from developing um, canned applications for data discovery, you know, a, a smarter approach. Let's see if I can move these slides on. So. Let's look back for a second. I mean, you know, this, this slide really represents our, our history, our heritage in, in analytics and databases. You know, 1958, you know, we're facing the, you know, facing the first challenge of what do, you know, what do we do with businesses? What data do we collect? You know, Howard Dresner proposed business intelligence as an umbrella term um, to describe concepts and methods to improve business decision making. Um, since then, we've been on this quest 
to get the answers we need from BI tools. And, and these answers that enable decisions to be made and, and strategies to put as ahead of, ahead of our competitors. Um, but we've got really complex infrastructures and platforms and increasing volumes of structured and unstructured data. And you know, the business users are really driving this you know, push for 24-7 anywhere access to insight. You know, the job is, is, no, you know, is far more difficult today than it's ever been. Um, but the importance of BI hasn't diminished. It's actually increased. And you know, I, I keep hearing you know, that data scientists are today's rock stars. Well, you know, I mean, one thing that I'm trying to push is to make everybody a rock star. Um, and, and I'll try and explain what we're doing that's different. So I mentioned the word smart. So what do we need to make a smart, dis you know, a smart data discovery tool? You know, a tool that can sit on top of all your BI sources, your data sources, and make it you know, easy for anyone to ask a question that leads to relevant answers you know, that, that fits the context. You know, that, you know, Jamie talked about this you know, concept of being able to filter down and get really down to the, you know, the insight that's required. And, and to do that in a time that you know, is normally today, you know, not waiting for IT to you know, you know, re rebuild applications or add in new data sources. And it's often, often referred to as actionable insight. And at the end of the day, that's what we're looking for. I mean, that's why I got into the industry, to try and drive actionable insight. Uh, and very similar to what Jamie has been saying. So are we, at, you know, are we there yet? Are we at the end of our quest? Well, in, in my view, we're still a long way, you know, a long way um, from, from this final nirvana of self-service BI that's smart and, and delivers the questions. But we are getting closer. You know, today's data discovery tools allow faceted search, visualization, they work on mobile devices, um, and you can share information and, and comment on things. You know, there's even predictive tools and alerting and KPIs, but in, in my mind and, and what we're trying to do that's different is, you know, they have a downside. You know, the downside is they have to be built. You have to, you know, spend time and effort building an application. You know, when they're done, they still might not ad adhere to the best practices. And they're constrained, which is a big thing, by today's thinking and today's interface. And you know, in my mind, it's all driven by the fact that you know, today's adoption of BI is still very low. You know, I think it's around 24, 25% of you know, business users have adopted BI. Now, we need to increase this. You know, we need to you know, democratize you know, insight, democratize BI, as, as Jamie was saying. So I'm going to take you into a bit of the future of what we're doing, and I'll, I'll bring it back to what we're delivering today. But if we had a smart data discovery tool, my, you know, this is my vision, my vision of what I'm pushing forward in our company, is you know, I, I'd see it as a combination of you know, HAL and Minority Report. You know, you'd wake up in the morning, you know, your device would, would tell you the key things you need to know, uh, you know, you know, bring to your attention that day. You would ask it some further questions for clarification, and it would explore the bits that are most interest for further insight for you. You'd then pinch and combine sources, you know, you know, immerse yourself in visuals, and take a couple of notes, share a report with your team, you know, while you're on the way to the office. You know, it sounds a bit far-fetched, but at Neutrino BI, we don't think so, and, and we're taking significant steps towards delivering this. Um, so let me expand a little bit further on the vision of Neutrino BI. I think there are three key components to a smart data discovery tool. Um, I mean, very simply, I've tried to make this very simple on this slide. There's the bit that allows you to ask questions. You know, there's the bit that enables you to interact with the data, collaborate, share it. You know, a beautiful interface. And and finally, I think the piece that you know, up until recently, we've all been missing. You know, this this is the you know the smart bit, the bit that adds an element of intelligence the ability to learn from the questions you are asking, you know, the ability to give you insight. So let's drill down a little bit further on, on, on each of these areas. So let's start with what makes a smart tool easy to question. Well, I mean, number one, you know, you get to ask it in any way you want. You know, today, 
Neutrino BI allows natural language based search, you know, very much like a search engine. You know, we are the first vendor to allow this free form questioning of BI data, but we're not stopping there. You know, we, we want to be able to use, you know, voice, touch, immerse themselves in interesting ways to ask questions. Um, that, that's like the first point. Secondly, you know, it's very important that the question you've asked is understood. Again, you know, today Neutrino enables some of that to happen through a set of background rules, temporal understanding, you know, synonyms, pseudonyms, um, and, and to cater for aliasing of data. So, you know, when, it, when you ask a question, it, it understands what you're, it understands the context and domain language. But we also need to take that further and, you know, get it to get further context, understanding the business domains even further, adding in location-based information of what, you know, where, you're, where you are when you're asking the question and on what device to be able to provide that additional insight. And, and, and finally, you know, the, the question should be asked of a universe of data, you know, all sources, whether it's unstructured big data, you know, and I kind of go along with the um, premise earlier on around, um, you know, what big data is. Um, and to me, it's just another data source. Um, you know, a neutrino, you know, today takes on board a broad range of data sources and then allows you, you know, natively to ask a question. Now, the next part, you know, the really interesting bit that we're working on today is bringing learning or a human element or a semi, you know, a machine human element back into the center of the process by listening and taking note of the questions that have been asked, not, not just by yourself, but by, you know, a wide range of people in your organization. You know, then asking you questions for clarification, narrowing down your meaning before it goes off to find the answer. But it also should automatically refine those question and answer based on the context, as I mentioned before. Um, and finally, you know, it needs to expand the picture with social insight, your team's questions, what other people have asked on different data sets, um, and bring that proactively, you know, serve, that, serve up that insight and alert you when, when you know, new questions or insight or answers you know, may have changed from before. Now, you know, we're doing you know, a small amount of this in Neutrino BI at the moment, but this is our main push. And I think this is where you know, it's a really key piece to enhance this concept of smart BI and true assisted discovery. You know, and covering what Jamie was discussing around getting results and 360 feedback loops to try and drive the you know, known unknowns and unknown no unknowns. Um, you know, so over the coming releases of our software, you know, we'll see we add more and more of this thinking you know, as you ask your question. You know, when we think this is, the, this is where the future really lies in, in data discovery tools. So let's touch on the beautiful interface. You know, the holy grail of the beautiful interface actually comes down to just one thing. It's personable. You know, it's not a one size fits all. It's the ability for the business user, you know, to do with it what they want. You know, and, and a few things make this possible. Um, you know, very sim you know, simple things like consistency, having the same user interface across all your devices. You know, no difference. And you can see in many of you know, many of the tools out there at the moment, they'll have, you know, one, you know, one version for iOS, one version for the web, one version for um, Android. You, know, you need to get consistency to allow this, you know, interface to flourish. It also needs to have an immersive, immersive experience, you know, not just having a web-based interface on a mobile device. You need to take full interaction, you know, touch, type, speak, 3D, you know, gesture control, and, and all be very, you know, crisp and clean. Um, and finally, you know, it, you know, the best presentation is embedded. It's not just um, an application that you build, but it's in real time. You know, when you're asking a question, when you've got that spark of a, spark of a question or insight that you want to ask, then it will build you that visualization on the fly. Now, Neutrino BI's interface is, you know, has been built, interestingly, using a games engine. And this gamification approach sets us apart from all the other tools because it allows us to provide high fidelity resolution and interactivity across all devices that all work the same, all with the same look and feel, and all with gesture control when it's allowed, you know, when it's enabled on the device. So, but what is also really important is that a smart BI tool will build your views, your dashboards on the fly as you ask a question, as I mentioned before you won't need to employ developers or IT in that loop to create an application. 
you know, once your data has been mapped in, you just ask a question. And Neutrino BI does this today. You know, what, is, what this really means is you get, you know, real agility. You're not constrained by the known associations between data or questions that are envisaged or, you know, by IT or analysts many months ago. It's questions you want to ask now. And that's because there's no development. And, you know, this is why Neutrino can be fully implemented in days rather than months. And, and, and I think, you know, from, from, my, from our perspective, as a, from, from a company vision, you know, driving, driving this sense of um, true agility is key. So let's, let's talk about what Neutrino BI actually is. So as a company, we formally launched in, in early 2012. We were awarded Gartner Cool Vendor, you know, one of, one of four companies in the world to do something different in analytics. And you know, we do something different because we've taken and combined you know, the best of two different, two different tool sets or two different technologies, you know, the search side and visualization. And it's really this fusion of two key technologies that gives us this unique experience, and a unique experience towards the nirvana of smart BI and true self-service. And you know, as, as a tool vendor today, you know, we've still got a way to go. So this is what Neutrino BI looks like on the questioning side. So you type a question in using natural language, and instantly get a carousel of ranked visual results that can be explored, manipulated, and visualized and built you know by by the business user into a dashboard you know into a dashboard or a report or then shared with you know um, you know your, your further staff in, in the organization so you know we, we, this is not you know building an application this is kind of building an application on the fly there's no developers in the loop doing this And again, just some of the um, imagery that you can get from a game-based, you know, game-based engine providing fully interactive 3D. I mean, all these all these charts are in a 3D world um, that allows us to do some very, you know, very interesting um, and immersive graphics. You know, and it's a common interface across multiple devices, and you know, touch, swipe, spin, pinch, all all the normal things that you'd really like to get from a from a BI tool. I'm just showing a few more um, screenshots, really, just showing the common experience across multiple devices, which we believe is key. And as I said, I suppose one of the key things this question-based approach takes is you can implement in days. There's no long development cycle anymore. There's no building an application. There's no developing. It's mapping the data, asking a question, dragging a visualization onto your, you know, onto your dashboard and you know sharing it as required. So it's a slightly different approach that we've taken. So we've not covered every aspect of Smart BI today, but you know Neutrino BI is aiming to add Smart into data discovery, and we're working hard to make it that way. You, I think you've all got the slides, so I, w I won't go through this, but. If you're interested in finding out more, there's um, some um, email addresses and uh, and a, a web to have a look at the new version. Okay, good. Good I mean, stuff. Thank well, you, thanks for listening. Yeah, absolutely. I want to ask you a couple quick questions before we get to the roundtable. One, could you talk a little bit about how you guys access data sources and what, what that mechanism is and how it's then delivered to the end user via these queries? Because I found mm -hmm. that to be one of the more interesting things about your approach is the way that you basically take this sort of thin slice of various data yeah. sets. Can you go into that? Yeah, I can do. So uh, again, we take a slightly you know, different approach to most of the vendors in the fact that we've built native adapters that, you know, for, for SQL Server, for Cognitio, for Teradata, um, you know, and, and all, all, you know, many more, you know, many more data sources. And natively, we talk to, you know, to the data source on the server that it's sat, and you know we 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 build the you know build the index on the fly, and if you've got you know a 500 terabyte um, data source, you know traditionally you'd have to pull all that data source back, build the index. We, you know, we don't. We we run the we run our query, our index building, um, on the fly, on the data source, 
and pulled back typically less than one percent of the data into this aggregated index that we ha we hold inside Neutrino that you then ask the question of. Mm -hmm. No, that's a very interesting approach. I guess let's kind of throw it around the room here. Jamie, you've worked with a whole variety of different tools out there in the marketplace, and I think you were kind of talking about that in your presentation, this evolution of disciplines like data discovery, for example, visualization, uh, other such discoveries, of course, data warehousing, uh, has been the the status quo or the the common way that most large organizations will try to marshal their data, get some kind of normalized strategic view of significant data assets. But have you come across this this technique of taking slices of data from many many different sources, putting it into I don't want to call it a a virtual data warehouse. That's not really what it is, but it is kind of like a giant. Uh, area for exploration of data. Have you come across that before? Uh, yes, Eric, yes. And it's a great question because it kind of goes to um, something that you need to do uh, if you want to get creative with data, and that is to have some sort of a sandbox, a place where you can combine existing data in new ways, bring new data sources in, explore it. Uh, typically not a production system, but a more of a laboratory environment where you can make mistakes, but you can also discover things. Some of your discoveries will lead to changes that are uh, operationalized and that do change operational systems. So that need for a sandbox has been there uh, for a long time. And, uh, you know, thinking back a decade or so, uh, the most common approach would be uh, a literal data consolidation Platform and uh, you know typically you might you might have called it back then a data mart a you know a purpose specific uh, collection of data uh, a, a data mart uh, that you know you're putting new things together maybe you're you're doing a better job of understanding customers in there but back then it was certainly um, being done with relational databases in a way it was just a you know. Uh, smaller cousin of a data warehouse, to your, to your point. Um, more recently, uh, some clients will say, okay, uh, we can get more agile if we do X. And I think some of the, it really dep depends upon case and, and purpose, but some of the attempts to become more agile include uh, data uh, visualization tools that allow um, the actual process to go faster. Um, also, uh, using new technologies like Hadoop, um, or other, um, you know, no NoSQL technologies. Um, now, going back though to what we're talking about today, this concept of discovery—that's an age-old thing. Of well, what's in my data, and how does it relate to uh, my problem? And you know, what I've seen is that many different data professionals, quote unquote, discover in different ways, but um, none of it's super efficient. The worst, of course, is you know. SQL queries and staring at data, or at least at this point, that's kind of on the low end of efficiency. Mm -hmm. um, I once had a, a, a client who built his own bespoke stuff. Tableau made it a little bit easier, but it's a very sort of limited part of the overall process. I like Tableau, but I think that sometimes it's misunderstood as having a broader application than it really does. Um, and similar, I'm not just singling out Tableau, but there are sort of best-in-class uh, data visualization apps that really only go a certain depth into the uh, data and the discovery, you still have to kind of make sure that your data has structure, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I'd be curious to hear more about it, but the most interesting slide to me about the Neutrino BI concept is to essentially uh, uh, cover more ground, but do it faster in the overall process from data to results. Mm, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. And John, correct me if I'm wrong, but you do not use SQL, or do you? No, we don't, we don't use SQL at all. So when we build our index, um, we're pushing natural language down into a proprietary index that then you know, filters out, ranks, produces a list, you know, a list of ranked results that then gets visualized on the fly. So we, we did find that you know, using, using SQL or traditional SQL-based um, approaches is very limiting. Um, mm -hmm. If you look at the set-based theory, you don't actually get back all the results you need, all the discoveries that you need. No, that's a really good point. Robin Bloor, what do you think about that? 
Um, well, yeah, I've always had a problem with SQL because it is pretty much set-based <laughs> mathematical language, and That's and there are other things that one can look at in data structures that you really can't get at well with SQL. It, it does. It's pathetic at hierarchies, for instance. It can't walk networks. It, it has no sense of order, and therefore, even in the data itself, if the um, if there's some sense in having the data in order, the relational database squashes that, and you end up taking a lot longer because you have to do loads of sorts. There are, you know, there are a lot of problems with SQL. I mean, I'm kind of interested in the natural language interface that um, Neutrino BI has got. It's very easy to. Um, to use the words natural language. I'd, I'd be interested if John could give us some idea. I mean, I don't care underneath how the natural re uh, language is resolved into a meaningful query to throw at data, I'm sure. I mean, it, that's probably the easier part of it, you know. Um, the, the more interesting thing is what kind of questions can you ask? What kind of questions do people ask with this interface? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, it, it's like uh, if it was put in front of me, I wouldn't actually, without in one way or another, asking someone know exactly what kind of questions to ask. You know, so John. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and that, that, is tr that is true. Actually, and, you know, we we definitely find two types of users. We find, you know, and I think it's to do with maturity of organisations and maturity of, the, of um, you know analytics at the, at the moment. You know, you get power users that you know they'll see the blank box, you know, the blank search box, and they'll still know what to ask. You know, and I'm sure you would, Robin, as well. You'd be able to go in there and ask some questions, and, and, and our tool, you know, prevent, you know, presents suggestions and offers up um, essentially a, a walk. You know, as you're typing, it'll present a walkthrough of the index underneath. You know, these are interesting things you want to look at. These are interesting things that you can, you, can, you know, a bit like a, a clever autocomplete. Um, but then you have the other side of the equation. I mean, I, you know, currently I think when we're selling our software, it's you know, maybe it depends on the organisation, but between one and ten percent will take the questioning ability. The nine, you know, ninety to ninety-nine percent just want a um, an app-like solution. So, you know, they, they'll they'll build something really quickly, ask some questions. Um, you know, the, the CXO level might have questioning ability, but the thousands of field workers or students have a pre-canned um, dashboard that's been built for them. We build that very fast, you know, because there's no developers in the loop. Um, but going, going back to the question of what can you ask, uh, you know, the, the, it's always a challenge, you know, and we're still, we're still working on this. You know, we're constantly iterating our, we call it our search core, constantly iterating the search core, to, which um, understands what's being typed in. I mean, obviously, you can type in anything. It will, it will pull out um, noise words. So noise words are ones that you know, don't, make, you know, don't make a difference when you're searching through the index. Um, it will also do you know, lookups against you know, custom dictionaries and things like this and do pseudonyms and synonyms. And you know, in, in that way, that helps the, the, the simple challenge of you've got an empty box and asking a question. But that's not enough. And, and I, I probably didn't get it across in the slides that Asking the question natural language is, is a is is only one one way of doing it. You know, we want well, we're working on technologies that allows um, visualization of your data or your your data universe in a way that you can um, spin it. You know, in 3D, drill down into it, drill into the, your world of the universe. You know, with with with, with your fingertips. And you know, I put up the figure of Minority Report which you think is, you know, in the future, but we're working with Microsoft as we speak to be able to do, you know, merging together with two different data sources on the fly with your hands, being able to drill down into your data with your fingertips, you know, and, and that's, that's like a, you know, something we're working on to really not, not move away from asking a question, but giving you a different ways of asking a question. Yeah, and if I could uh, jump in here, we have a couple good questions here already that are frankly on my mind as well. So just to kind of phrase it as the attendees have thrown in their questions, one is asking, how are the indices converted into correlated attributes and measures? And then what role do ontologies have underneath there? Um, so when, I mean, as with, all, as with all tools, when you connect to a data source, um, I mean, you know, there's no developers in the loop building an application, but you, you still need somebody that decides um, what data you want to be presented to the engine, essentially. So, 
um, you know, you, you can build these domains which cover your facts and measures and, um, you know, what data you want to bring in. And from that, it then, you know, spins up and builds that index on the fly. Um, does that answer the question? Um, yeah, that's, that's part of it. And then I guess in terms of the semantics underneath, do you have any kind of sophisticated ontology or or lexicon or is it, I mean you, you've talked about synonyms for example a lot of it is pretty sophisticated stuff but are there ontologies such that um, you know for example in a particular company certain products might fall under a certain product line can yeah. you capture that kind of a hierarchy in in your tool yes I mean whatever the structure exists I'll, I'll cover two points whatever structure exists in your in, in your you know, data source, you know, the hierarchy, that is, that is pulled through and understood by the natural language search. So it will rank higher, you know, based on what you've typed in, the higher up the hi hierarchy. Uh -huh. Or if you, you know, if you ask a question that's, you know, by region or by, by a time, it will drill down further into that hierarchy. So that's, that's fairly, I would say it's fairly simple to do, but that's, that's the simple side of it. Um, the, the, the stuff we're working on that's quite clever um, is, is around providing uh, maybe not ontologies but really this concept of domain specific understanding which mm -hmm. is a bit like a custom dictionary um simplistically um but you but end users can build these things you know um, so if you go into a certain you know we're working with some pharmaceutical companies that have you know very specific language or in you know law firms a very specific language and you know they can build up um their own i suppose ontologies very quickly to be able to um, you know, I suppose alias things that they'd like to um, to ask if it's not already built into the tool. Mm -hmm. And what kind of visibility can, let's say, the person responsible for provisioning the solution on site? You know, maybe it's a senior director or something mm -hmm. of a an analytics department. What kind of visibility does that person get into whatever aggregations the the tool has developed over time, and whatever that taxonomy looks like or whatever those uh, semantical searches or representations look like, can you get under the hood as, 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 an, a, admin, as an admin user? As yeah. an, I mean, we have several types of users, but the admin user gets full control of um, you know, domain creation, the, the refresh rate of the data that's coming through, um, how you want to be able to combine um, you know, data sources. You know, we, we can add data sources on the fly, you know, add Excel into the into the dashboard, combine that with, you know, your data warehouse or with Salesforce in the cloud, and bring all those together with no development experience at the front end. So, I mean, you, you talked about this, you know, virtual data warehouse, and you know, a lot of our clients are are, are really, you know, struggling with the concept of having to build a data warehouse. You know, the, back in 1958, build a data warehouse. Um, today, that's too hard and takes too long. So, the concept of getting true agility is bring the data in as you require it at the time and ask a question. Mm -hmm. no, we're seeing, we're seeing that from large, large organizations that you know, have spent many, many years building a data warehouse and they've still not brought all their data in. They're now saying, okay, let's just virtually produce a layer. Yeah, and ask a that's exactly again. right. Yeah, we talk about that all the time on the show. On, on many different episodes, we've talked about that very trend and I think it's very mm -hmm. real. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Let me throw um, one question over to you, Jamie, and then John and, and Robin, if you want to comment on it. It's a pretty good question. One of the attendees asks, how do you control and manage data proliferation and replication during data discovery or various what-if exercises? I love that question. Yeah, uh, it's a great question, and it goes to, I mean, implied by that question is that if you don't control and manage the proliferation and replication uh, that will naturally occur as you experiment with data uh, and do different things in, let's say, a sandbox, um, you're going to create uh, a lot of duplication, and if it's not well documented, you'll have uh, more than just a problem of, of lots of, of data to store. You'll have a, a major uh, risk of, uh, uh, of using the wrong data for a certain purpose. It's basically a nightmare from a data governance perspective and from a data quality perspective and for, from a process management perspective. Uh, so uh, I'll just give a really brief answer on process in terms of how to do it uh, generically. Um, I'm 
very interested uh, to know how the Neutrino BI tool would enable or not enable it. I'd love to get John's thoughts on this. Uh, but process-wise, you absolutely need to have a process in place where even though you're experimenting, you're also leaving an audit trail, something traceable, so that you actually know the origin, just like a bottle of fine wine, you do need to know the providence of this data. And this data, if I were to, to describe it, is the result of every single operation you've done on this data to produce it, which may be tens or hundreds of operations. You took the data, then you did something else, you moved it here, you copied it there. And uh, even if you're experimenting, there needs to be some periodic review of the audit trails, uh, periodic um, um, uh, dismissal or, or, uh, or retiring of, of data sets that are duplicate and uh, basically making sure that you're learning. Part of what you need to learn is, well, this is how we did it and we can do it, do it that way again. Yeah, good point. John, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, as I mentioned before, we take that slightly different approach. So, I mean, first off, our tool manages full data lineage all the way through. So every operation you take, is fully managed, fully tracked, fully audited, but also we can visually represent that, which is you know quite interesting. Um, the fact that we have these native adapters producing these you know thin data slices means that we are not actually proliferating the data. The data actually resides in the data source that is being managed. So, um, and I'll just explain what that means. So we we build the aggregate on the fly, bring that into Neutrino. Um, if you want to drill down to atomic level data, you go back to source. So there is, no, there is no full copies of data um, with Neutrino. And that's why some of the big, um, you know, like, like Teradata and Cognitio, have selected us as their, um, you know, one of their vendors mm. because mm. You know, they're not losing control. Mm. Um, secondly, and I suppose, again, quite interestingly, we, we allow, you know, we all know that Excel you know, is you know, used as probably 99% of all BI analytics in most organizations. Or if it's not, it's part of it. Um, we decided to embrace that rather than push that away. So we, um, you know, we allow Excel to be taken into that data lineage approach. So I can drag an Excel sheet onto the dashboard, onto the canvas, combine that with, you know, a, you know another data source, a data warehouse, and produce a new visualization. If that, if that Excel data underneath changes, you know, we, we manage that full flow of data full flow of um, data lineage and you also you can you know leverage complex macros that have you know been built over many years in many organizations and we were seeing that as being you know quite a pull for some organizations that they want to leverage their existing investment in excel and keep that under control in a data lineage way um, so and i suppose then finally you know when you've got all this data in one place and you've got this you know incredible power to ask a question you have to be pretty careful. You have to be pretty careful who gets access to the data and who can see that data. So we've got a very complex um, you know, data level security. So not, not just role-based security, but we can tie roles to data domains that you've pulled in. So we can hmm. say, um, well, if somebody asks a question, um, they can see that level of data um, in, those, in those data sets, but they can't see can't see others. And even when you share and publish dashboards um, with, with your um, colleagues, if they don't have a security, they will not see those um, dashboards or those, or, those, or those charts. And if they question it, it filters all, all those out. So I think keep the data in one place, virtually bring it together, you know, embrace Excel, bring that into the, into the fore and then put full data level security, not just role based, but data level security across all of it. That's that's my answer. A new yeah, answer. That's that's pretty interesting stuff you just described. So when you talk about building the aggregates on the fly, mm. uh, what I'm guessing is that this uh, the engine is basically running in the background all the time and as users are asking questions it's being slightly modified. But how how real time is that? I mean are, are you able to actually uh, because obviously for any of these data sources, you're taking a slice of data from the source. How yeah. often does that refresh? What kind of limits do you run into in terms of accessing different sources? That's one other question from the audience is what data sources. And it's basically any source that can have like a JDBC connection or something like that. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, it, it is. I mean, you know, we, 
we both we, we, we do um, both you know traditional structured data you know your oracles your SQLs your cognitios your teradatas but now that now that those players have also embedded you know Hadoop like um, you know capabilities you know cognitio can now um, drive Hadoop and then provide structure to us and the same with Aster data through teradata you know we, we're not limited now by um, you know, as long as it presents itself in some level of structure that we can then build a domain against and, and build the index, um, that's fine. You know, there's, there's no issue. We, I mean, we, we are not a tool that searches across emails and, and Word documents because, I mean, we don't see a huge amount of um, value in that in the, in the true analytical space. Um, yeah. Well, let's see. Let's bring in Dr. Bloor again. You know, to kind of close the loop on our mission for today of identifying what you need for quality discovery, I do really like this approach that Neutrino takes of taking thin slices from every data set that you, that you want to meaningfully access and giving you some kind of an aggregate. I do feel like there, it's not that there would be quote-unquote data quality problems, but there would certainly be data quality issues that you want to keep in mind as you navigate through that kind of environment. But it seems to me that having this kind of broad-based access to various information sources all delivered through a central user interface that is interactive and somewhat dynamic, that's a pretty good piece of the puzzle for quality data discovery, right? Yeah, I, I, I guess. I mean, I, you have to create a kind of hub, in my opinion. You know, you have to create a hub, and you, it has to have its fingers and everything. There are lots of issues in this. I mean, you know, if data cleansing is an issue, and it can be an issue, that isn't really the that really isn't the um, responsibility of the front end tool. Somebody's got to do that at the back end. That's data governance. But you know, I also like the point that Jamie is making about provenance. Most people don't even think about provenance. If you were to take the average data warehouse out there, you discover that nobody knows where the data came from in terms of, you know, <laughs> row by row of the table. They wouldn't know the provenance. And, you know, this starts to become, you know, it's an interesting point to make, but it's really got, you know, nothing to do with Neutrino product, really. But it's, when you take a table and you add up the columns, you create new data. When you've got an aggregate, it's new data. That data didn't exist before you added it up. It's new data. If someone then makes a decision based upon those aggregates, then in theory as an organization, you'd want to be able to have an audit trail as to why they made the decision. You know, the BI tool may have presented them with some aggregates, but why did they make the decision? And if the decision was wrong, and, and then the question starts to be, well, where did the aggregates come from? You know, what's the provenance of these aggregates? And we haven't got to this stage in BI in the sense that a lot of people don't talk about this issue. But this is actually a very, very real issue, and it's not trivial. And um, I salute Jamie for raising it, actually, because um, you know, it's not all that. we could probably do an hour on this. It, 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 it's like he didn't explain where all the bodies are buried. He just said, there's some bodies that are buried. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's about right. It's very interesting, too, that you have this both role-based and database security. So mm -hmm. I, I'm kind of seeing a hierarchy of security hurdles that someone has to get through, John, in order to get access to certain data sets. And I'm guessing that's something which the power user or the person who controls the tool and access to the tool can can draw lines of demarcation around exactly. right, in terms of data yeah, I mean, you know, so Some of our customers don't even activate that. They just say, you know, we're happy for the day, all data be, to be shared. But, so, you know, some of our financial um, customers we're working with are, are, pr are pretty careful on, um, they want all the data to be searched, but only by certain people, you know. And, and, you know, it's, it's, it's a fairly powerful way of doing it. Rather than having to constant, I mean, traditionally, you'd build different data sets. You know, so if you go to another, another tool, you'd build different data sets or little applications that allow just them to view that information. But we can do it all from one tool and do it at a you know, configuration level, data level. And let me throw this one at you. One of the other attendees had asked, is it possible to visualize the number and distribution of transaction values, not just the average? So I know you can go, as you say, direct to data, and I like that mm -hmm. expression. Um, but can you, I suppose, a, a broadening of the question is, can you, as a power user, expand or constrain the type of slice that you're 
tool is taking from a particular data source? Um, so the ad, the admin user can, yes. Yeah, so the admin user um, can, the person that connects to the data source, can decide to pull all the data in, or two tables, or you know a, a certain subset. So yeah, right. and it's very and it's very easy to you know broaden or narrow the scope of that data pull. Yeah, that's very interesting. That's a cool approach. Uh, let me see. I know we have a couple more questions. We're going a bit long here, but thank you so much for for sticking with us, speakers. We have uh, over 80 people still on the line after 70 minutes, so that's a good sign. Um, let's see, here's a question. Is Neutrino being evaluated for the next Magic Quadrant from Gartner? I see it was a cool vendor in 2012, but just wondering about uh, where you kind of fit in that Gartner view these days. Yes, I mean, we're working very closely with Gartner, and, um, you know, the evaluation is, I think the next one's coming out um, later this year. Um, well, we haven't decided yet. I mean, we want to we want to go in strong into the in, into the quadrant, um, and you know we're working hard to do that. Okay, good. And Jamie, let's just get some closing remarks from you and from Robin, and maybe from John. I really like your focus on the process and avoiding linearity. It's kind of a difficult thing to do because we tend to think in very linear terms typically, but there is this ongoing cycle, and it's a cycle I think in some ways that can confound people because it takes various durations and takes various forms, meaning sometimes you want to cycle back very quickly, sometimes you want to cycle back over very long periods, almost like the, the planets circle the sun at their own, at their own speeds and trajectories and, and distances and so forth. But do, can you just elaborate on that in terms of, of why data discovery needs to really live in all these different parts of the cycle? Uh, sure, that's a great question. Um, and maybe to take your point about the cycles being different depending upon what you're doing, um, I'll, I'll start there by pointing out that there are some types of analysis that tend to be more traditional ones. Let's take calculating customer profitability at the customer level, doing it monthly, doing it quarterly. Uh, you're using internal transaction data, finance data, et cetera, quote unquote small data, traditional data. Um, you're probably going to just do that every month, and that's not going to change much, and your exploration of it will occur on that cycle as well, um, and it may get somewhat predictable until, of course, you begin to add new data sources that help you better understand other attributes of customers and better correlate and then even predict um, what a customer will do in the future, what their customer lifetime value will be, not just based on their transactions, but based on other things you know about them. At that point, you're getting more experimental, and in general, as you get more experimental, you're going to want to follow faster cycles because you essentially haven't really created a new uh, repeatable process that takes place upon some business cycle. Uh, so, in general, I would say that, you know, it's a choice that you need to make intentionally, how fast the cycles would be, but in general, the more experimental and the less defined uh, the, the value of the, uh, the past cycles goes up. The other comment I would make, and this kind of goes back to John's answer to um, my question or, or John's response to the question from the audience that I commented on around uh, data provenance. Uh, Anything that actually makes it easier for the human being to understand a longer process without getting confused, in my experience, is going to actually reduce the barrier to benefit. So I really liked aspects of what were described that essentially take problems I was describing and at least to some degree take a different approach to them. I don't know enough about it to say for sure what it, what it fully solves and, and what use cases are still off uh, out, out of scope. But that was really interesting to me and I think something I'd love to learn more about. Yeah, sure. And Robin, I'll kind of bring you in to discuss this a little bit. And we talked about the, the, the topic of data quality in our data science webcast uh, earlier this month. And I'll bring it up again because it, it really is kind of fascinating when you take a, a few steps back and think about data quality in the broader context and realize that there are always going to be some data quality problems, always. I think it was Dr. Malofsky in a previous show who said you need to determine whether or not the purpose for this data analysis is stochastic or deterministic. In one case, it's not terribly important. In the other case, it's extremely important. So you do need to know what the use case is and, and make sure that's part of your decision-making process. But what I find kind of 
uh, interesting or perhaps amusing is that uh, if you worry too much about the, about granular data quality, you're kind of barking up the wrong tree because there's always going to be something there somewhere along the line. It could just be that somebody misinterprets something that you tell them when you give them a recommendation. So the thing I like about what our folks here at Neutrino are doing, Neutrino BI, is enabling this kind of broad-based, deep exploration of data. And you have to have that caveat in the back of your mind, all right, well, maybe there's an aggregation in here somewhere that, that isn't quite accurate, but, but let's face it, if you find something interesting, that's when you go deeper and make sure that you have the right perspective, the right insight. Uh, that's kind of a mouthful, but Robin, what do you think about that? Well, I mean, first of all, it's kind of worth saying that a lot of data quality issues are discovered by exploration <laughs> of the data. You know, you get outliers and you think, you know, oh, this is a very strange outlier, and you discover, you know, because it's like it's the only one, you know. Um, and you discover, oh, it's a pregnant man. Well, you know, there aren't any pregnant men. So so that means that it's, uh, at least I've never met any. Uh, so that means it's, it's, it's a data error. You know, and the, I mean, the truth of the matter is that, you know, data errors arise any time data moves, there's possibility of data error plus the time it's captured. You know, so it's like there isn't going to be, you know, the only the only kind of data flows I can think of that are pretty much guaranteed to be good is when it comes straight from a center, uh, from a sensor machine generated straight into um, a, a reliable heap that stores it. Otherwise, you've got the possibility of data error. You know, and that's always going to be the case. Malofsky's actually pinned it down, you know. If it's deterministic, you care. If it's stochastic, then you, you only care about the rate of error to see how much it's going to throw you out, you know, or throw out your conclusions. Um, and that's part of it. But, you know, most people don't even understand. Most people that are doing, you know, data discovery don't even understand those terms. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, let's get just some final comments from John uh, Woodward. I thought it was a very good presentation today. Uh, any closing thoughts from you, having heard the perspectives of Jamie and Robin? Uh, I mean, I actually think we're all pretty much aligned. I mean, you know, the analytics industry for the last 50 years has been trying to solve, you know, a fairly simple thing, which is, you know, provide an answer to a question. And we've spent a lot of money doing it and built some very complex um, solutions to try and get there. Um, I think we just need to make it simpler. We need to make it simple um, to gain insight in fast time. And mm -hmm. that's what we're trying to do. And, yeah. you know, hopefully the audience, um, you know, got some interesting insight. Yes, indeed. All right, folks, this wraps up a, a rather interesting hot technology 75 minutes of great conversation big thank you to our friends at neutrino bi and of course to jamie fitzgerald of fitzgerald's analytics and our very own dr bloor we do archive all these webcasts top online to insideanalysis.com the archive is usually up right after the show it just takes a couple of minutes so feel free to jump online to find out more about that and otherwise we'll catch up to you next week folks thanks again so much for your time and attention we really appreciate it we'll catch up to you next time Bye bye <laughs>